So hello everyone. Um, so my name is Yanis. I'm one of uh, the co-hosts. So for now we we have a student panel. So we have uh, six amazing uh, PhD students, volunteers that uh, will discuss about their experience in UCI. Uh, feel free to ask any questions that you have, okay, related uh, to the life at UCI, the housing, courses, course load, uh, you know, how, how many TAs they, they had to do, um, how, how nice and beautiful beaches uh, there are in, uh, in Vine area and so on and so forth. So let me introduce you to, uh, to the students. So we have uh, with us uh, Thorben, uh, Thorben Trobst, uh, Gavin Kerrigan, uh, Rob Logan, uh, Nada Lajuji, uh, Kus uh, Dave, and uh, Pretty. I, I hope I didn't uh, uh, butcher the, the names, uh, hopefully. Um, so please, guys, I, I guess, Thorben, you can start uh, by sharing your experience in UCI. Um, OK, maybe we should do like a, an introduction round, I guess. So Yeah, yeah sure. Uh, so about me, I'm currently a second year PhD student. Um, I am, so I'm doing PhD in computer science in the CS theory group. Um, my advisor is Vijay Vazirani. And yeah, so I, I've been here now for about one and a half years. Of course, uh, a significant, significant chunk of that was in the lockdowns, but uh, also sometime before. So I think I can answer various questions like that. Um, who wants to introduce themselves next? Will we go in order here? Uh, I'll, I'll go next. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Gavin. Um, I'm also a second year PhD student uh, in the computer science program. Um, I primarily work on statistical machine learning problems, uh, and I work with Parks. Yeah. Hi, um, okay, you can go next. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Preeti. I'm a first year PhD student um, in machine learning, working with Stefan Mont. So um, I started during the pandemic, so I can definitely answer any questions about that. Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Rob. I am a fourth year PhD student in computer science, and I am co-advised by Samir Singh and Parik Smith, and primarily work on NLP research problems. Um, so since I'm a fourth year, I was here in the magic before times when we weren't all locked in our houses, and I can maybe talk a little bit more about that if anyone's interested. You're muted. Uh, okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Nada. I'm also a first year uh, BC student. Uh, my area of uh, focus is uh, database systems. I'm currently working with um, uh, Sharad Maratra. And um, yeah, I also started during the pandemic. So it's been fun. <laughs> you're, you're muted. OK, can you hear me? Yeah, no, yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Kush. Uh, I'm a second year PhD student, but I also did my bachelor's from UCI. Uh, so I started like immediately after I finished my bachelor's. So I've been here for a good part of like five years. Um, yeah, and I, I can also talk about like life before pandemic. Um, my research area is basically binary analysis and security. And I work with uh, Professor Ian Harris. Okay, so I guess we need some questions, right? I, I saw that there was a, a document with some questions. Maybe you can go through those first. Let's 
So I think the first one is the the oh, classic. Uh, I, I posted I, I posted the link to everybody that has. Uh, can you see in the chat? Um, there are some questions. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and of course, people can also ask questions in the in the chat. So I guess the first one is the classic: uh, "Can I live in Irvine without a car?" <laughs> yes, I think that's a very classic question. So I personally don't have a car. Uh, I would say if you and and I also saw somebody already wrote uh, pretty similar to what I would say, which is that um, uh, you can bike pretty much everywhere here uh, if you want to because. The weather is like very consistent, so um, usually it's not like you you have a you know a certain appointment that you want to get to by bike, and then suddenly there's a thunderstorm. That's pretty rare, and also there's like uh, pretty good bike trails and very wide uh, sidewalks that you can also bike on most of the time. Um, so it's definitely possible to get to most places within like a few miles radius of the campus. So if you want to go to like Newport Beach or something like that, it's very much possible to do so without a car. Um, I think eventually you might want one to get to kind of the areas that are a little bit further away from campus more easily. But I would say at least like in the first year or so, I would get like a bicycle right away or some other method of proportion. I, I actually don't use a bicycle. I actually use like long distance inline skating to go to places. Um, which is also very possible. I think this is the kind of stuff I use normally to go places, which is very similar to biking, basically. It's it's got to be a little intense with the hills around campus, though, right? Uh, yeah. I mean, it's not too bad. It's uh, the worst thing is living on a hill, which I do, because <laughs> you always got to go down like really fast. But yeah. So I would say it's uh, possible to get around. Yeah, I think you definitely can. Um, I, I think the one caveat I would make is that if you are planning on living off campus, um, yes, then it becomes you. much yeah. more difficult yes. to get around without having a car. The bus system is it's functional, bad. but it's, it's relatively <laughs> slow. Um, places that you could drive in 15 minutes take like an hour to get to on bus. Yeah, the, bus, the public transit here is bad. So I would say if you want to get to places, you should use a bike or a car. Um, yeah. Um, one one question very related to whether you live on campus or off campus, right? Mm -hmm. uh, except the distances, is uh, how expensive is the rent uh, in campus and off campus, right? So there is this also question. Uh, I, can, I can answer that. Um, so uh, for my undergrad, I for, for for first year I lived in uh, on campus housing. And then for subsequent like four years, I lived in off campus, and uh, I can uh, I can like um, confidently say that off campus housing is uh, a bit more expensive than on campus housing. So uh, if you have like housing guarantees, then you should definitely try to get housing on campus rather than off campus. So can you give us estimates, Kus, about the uh, yeah? Yeah, sure. Um, so uh, single bed. Um, like single room, single bed um, can go anywhere from like 1500 to like over 2500, 3000 easily in Irvine or like in general, like in the campus area. Uh, as you go like farther away from campus towards the city, maybe it gets cheaper, but it's not as cheap as um, so like in Verano or Palo Verde, which is like uh, the de facto um, graduate housing where it's like it's relatively cheaper in uh, like the range of like 1200 to maybe 1500 at most. Yeah, I think it, it depends on what your what your situation with having roommates is. So I also live have lived off campus my whole time. Um, and I lived in Tustin for multiple years and ended up splitting rent and paying like 700 a month, which I think is comparable to what it costs to live on campus. Um, but you do end up having to commute every day, pay for parking permits and stuff like that. Um, and the commute is like, a, it's 15 to 20 minutes. So it's it's a little bit away from campus. So if, if you have a roommate and you share, uh, let's say living room, uh, would I say um, a safe estimate is around uh, 1,100, something like that? 
uh, on, on campus maybe on campus i would say it's probably closer to like 800 900 ah, it's it's less it's less yeah. okay 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 so That's, it's less uh, yeah so my, less than, my less current than rent is around 850 or something like this 850 with one and one unit yeah. one one interesting point is that if you live on campus you are close to groceries right so pretty yes. much yeah there are two, three supermarkets uh, and many, many restaurants in the uh, university also, center. And, uh, yeah, also like utilities are prepaid and internet okay. is included. Internet, okay. So yeah. 850 Long is the total cost. Yeah. yeah. Pa Parik, also, also, had a, <laughs> Parik so. also had a good point in the, um, com the written response to this, which is that um, you're only, if you, if you give up your housing the first year, then you're not guaranteed housing for the rest mm. of the time you're a student. So if you if you don't have a strong preference for living off campus, it's almost always better to move on campus, at least for the first year, because um, otherwise you, you might not have the option. So Rob, do you know if uh, every first year student is guaranteed housing in uh, campus? No. I think PhD students are, but yeah. masters yeah. are not. Yes. That's, okay. that's what I so it's first come first served in this case if you have a guarantee then you uh, you'll get it because it's a guarantee you but okay. if you if you don't then it's mostly based on a wait list wait list yes yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah so we also had another housing question about uh, is it possible to get housing without roommates it's difficult i would say on campus housing yeah um I mean, obviously, you can put down a bunch of the single bed apartments as your first choices, but uh, they are almost always uh, full really quickly. So I would not bet on it at all. Like, if you absolutely need to live without roommates, then you probably have to look off campus. And as other people have said, further away from the campus as well, because it will be too expensive in Irvine itself. OK. So what about uh, activities? How do you meet people? How do you socialize? I mean, okay, I guess pre-COVID is more, <laughs> more important. <laughs> After, yeah, now. So uh, from my experience, uh, like the student body here uh, has these events, like night outs and stuff um, in, in the, uh, like the, the terrace of the student center. I think uh, mm -hmm. where like uh, they have like karaoke nights and like open bars or something. I, mm -hmm. I, I didn't go much. Like I wish I had gone, you know, like uh, <laughs> I came into 2019. So all these events were like in fall. So I, I wish I had gone, but you know, I, I, <laughs> yeah, I didn't find time for it, but there are these events also um, they like for international students, they have, um, like trips or something to LA, um, mm. like San Diego, where uh, like you can socialize with other international students. And uh, like they have activities all around the year. So, and you get like constant emails about it. So it's like really hard to miss. And you get like, you get to RSVP well in advance. So, yeah. Let, let me just say that LA is f almost 40 miles away. So it's not that far, okay. So for those that uh, didn't, yeah. So it's uh, it's pretty easy to to visit LA and uh, go to watch a stand up comedian or uh, oh, also Disneyland is very close by, right? Uh, it's Anaheim, like, yeah. It's yeah, uh, twenty minutes. Twenty minutes. I skated there yesterday. <laughs> uh, so yeah. So Thorben is an athlete. So he, he's, he can skate from any place to any other place. Uh, also, Outside. there's like not not berries too. If you like uh, like roller coasters and rides and stuff, mm. I think yeah. I mean, just generally talking about like the proximity of stuff to Irvine. Like in Southern California, you also have access to beaches that are maybe like twenty minute, fifteen minute drive from oh, campus. Yeah. Newport. Um, Newport. There's also like skiing close by. You can drive an hour and 20 minutes, mm -hmm. hour and 40 minutes up to Big Bear and there's a bunch of ski hills. Um, there's desert. If you like desert, there's a lot of national parks. Um, so, so there's a lot of different um, 
outdoor activities that you have access to in this part of Southern California, which is pretty nice. But again, you probably need a car to access a lot of it. Pretty much. So a salary question. Um, yeah, so is the PhD salary enough to support married PhD students? So I guess the question is, you have two, two salaries, right? It's, each student has one salary. I guess the question is not very easy to answer because depends if you have kids. I mean, let's yeah. assume you don't have kids. Basically, let's, let's talk about the salaries in general. Hopefully, Sarif will get uh, an answer from this. So how do you feel about the salary? Uh, so the chair said that uh, you are always guaranteed uh, to have funding. Uh, apparently, if your advisor has grants, uh, you can have RAs, so, which means focus only on research. And this is what uh, the advisors are aiming for. But the, the, the salary is, is pretty much uh, the same uh, for all the students. And the, the question is, are you, are you, I mean, okay, you, you don't, you will not make a fortune from your PhD. I mean, that's obvious, right? <laughs> that's obvious. Uh, that's obvious. But, but are you comfortable? So, I mean, personally, yes, I, it, it, it depends on everyone's situation though. So I think having, having funding for an RA ship um, is definitely an important consideration when picking to join a graduate program. So if you haven't discussed that with whoever your potential advisor is yet, um, I definitely recommend discussing that because essentially that's the difference between getting paid to do research most of the time or getting paid to grade papers most of the time. And then you have to do your research on top of that. Um, so is like the, is the salary enough to live off of? Yeah, you definitely can. You end up paying like 40% of your salary towards rent every month. Um, the cost of living expenses um, aren't exorbitant if you don't, if you live a modest lifestyle. Um, but obviously you're not gonna go like on shopping sprees every weekend or anything <laughs> like that. Um, another thing to consider is that you get a lot of additional funding from fellowships if you apply to them. So that can amount to having an extra couple hundred dollars a month or a couple extra thousand dollars every year. And that also makes life a lot more comfortable as does um, internships. So I've had very good experience getting internships at different companies and that you know, magically makes life much easier if you're able to do that. So one one other question is about uh, the the coursework. Basically, if if you done enough courses, if you are eligible for a master's, uh, basically on the, you know, while you are doing your PhD, and uh, if if you know something like that, and uh, basically in the first two years of your PhD. If you basically get a master's degree on, on the fly. Uh, actually, I'm in this position. So, okay. uh, That's yeah, good. Um, yeah, I came in as PhD, but I'm also getting my master's along the way uh, next quarter. Uh, so the, the process is pretty simple. You contact your advisor. Um, so let me go over this first. Um, uh, the, the requirement is you have to pass three core courses with comprehensive like uh, exams, right? Uh, once you do that, then you have to take, uh, I think, 11 other elective courses and um, three quarters of uh, CS200S. Once you do that, uh, the quarter before you, uh, you plan to get your degree, you have to apply for advancements, uh, advancement to master candidacy. And once you do that, um, then, then it's... Yeah, then it's pretty easy. Like you just have to pass uh, three core courses with the comprehensive one. The catalog might have changed, but yeah, it's more or less the same. Yeah, and I think those requirements directly are the requirements for the PhD. So it's not, I don't think you end up doing extra work. Yeah, not really, I don't think. I also just wanted to add, depending on the class, the comprehensive exam, to my understanding, is just like doing well or getting a certain grade. Yes. It, it's final. usually, yeah, just, just the final or something. So it's not added work, which is really nice. Yeah. yeah. 
that that's can someone remind me is this this is just cs students right yeah i think so okay because i know i know that the stats comprehensive exams are usually much more um it's a much harder process um but yeah for for us it's pretty nice you can just if you do well in your courses, then you end up um, satisfying the comprehensive exams. Most of the time, like finals satisfy the comprehensive part. And you have to like get a B or above in finals. That that's that's it. Okay, we have some questions about like what if you already have a master's degree, et cetera. So you can uh, get some courses uh, waived or, or transferred or whatever. Um, that is possible. You have to fill out some forms and show basically that they're roughly equivalent and stuff like that. So I wouldn't expect to like get rid of almost all of course requirements, but you can definitely shave off like a quarter or two or maybe even three by getting a bunch of courses transferred. Um, yeah, personally, I didn't find that to be too necessary. So I actually have a master's as well, but um, I mean, there's no huge rush, I would say, to get the courses done. I mean, if you're, if you're already doing research with your advisor anyways, it's not really a huge hurdle, I would say, to do a course here and there. So you may find that uh, you initially intend to waive a bunch of courses and then decide, ah, why not? This course looks interesting. Let me do one course per quarter anyways while I'm doing research. And then you don't actually need it in the end. That's what happened to me. Yeah. Also, like it, for, at least for my experience as an ML student, there's a lot of really cool ML courses you can take, yeah. um, and a lot of them end up being project based instead of final based. So it's usually like a good opportunity to try out some research ideas um, that maybe you you would have difficulty doing as your like main thrust of research. Um, so so they end up being there's there are some courses that can end up being kind of more fun to take um, than anything else. It, it doesn't really feel like a huge burden on your time or like you're doing something just to like ch check some boxes. Okay, let's see. What other questions do we have? Uh, is housing available from summer or from fall? It depends. Basically, when you uh, do the housing application, you can pick your preferred starting month and you get to check, pick like priorities, like what do you care more about the starting month or the number of roommates or stuff like that. And so I think there are leases that start all the way in like summer and some that start basically just before the quarter starts. So it's all the way from like, I don't know, July to September or something like that at the least start dates. And so, yeah, you, if you want to, you can definitely get an earlier lease. So one other question is uh, about how do you compare Palo Verde and Verano place? And uh, what is the experience of living in a townhome or non-townhome floor plans? Now it's very technical, I'm not sure. Is there anybody that can answer this? Um, yeah, I live in Verano Place in a okay. townhome, so it's, it's um, <clears throat> my apartment is a two-bedroom townhome, and um, I currently live with my partner, um, but if you have a roommate, you'll each get your own room. Um, you share a bathroom, but you'll have your own sink and stuff, um, so these townhomes are really kind of set up to, to be shared with roommates, um, but they're not like uh, undergraduate dorms, really. They're, they're more like apartments, um, and so... Um, they're, they're pretty reasonable, nice living accommodations, um, especially for the price that you pay for them. Um, as for comparing to uh, between Palo Verde and Verano Place, I think Palo Verde is a bit newer, um, but the apartments tend to be a bit more expensive. Um, it kind of depends if you'd rather pay, you know, a few hundred dollars more a month for, for a newer place or if you would rather um live in somewhere that's a bit more affordable but perhaps a few years older um i will say that the on-campus housing um you do not have air conditioning so if that's something that is a deal breaker for you i would definitely look off campus um generally you don't need air conditioning for 
10 months out of the year, but um, maybe for a month or two during summer, it can get pretty brutal. Um, so just something to be aware of. Uh, you might want to, to buy a portable AC unit for, for the summer months. So what other questions were there? Uh... Right, so yeah, we had the question about Slack and Zoom and Discord and that kind of stuff. So I know at least in my group, we have a, a Slack for our group, like for the theory group. There is a UCI Discord, which is also posted. Um, but that's, that's for all students. So I think it's mostly for undergrads, um, but I am in there at least, but I don't know, <laughs> it's, uh, it exists. So. But I would say uh, uh, each group probably does their own thing. So we have a, a Slack and a theory group. Well, one of the questions I'm seeing is whether there's a lab rotation policy and the ability to change advisors. So does, does anyone want to comment on that? I, I guess I can, I can start. Um, so, so I, I said at the beginning that I'm co-advised by Parak Smith and Samir Singh, and I have been since I was admitted into the PhD program. Um, and in my experience, that's a fairly common setup for students. So maybe like half of the members, a little under half of the members in Samir's lab are co-advised by someone. Um, and even if you're not co-advised, there's, there's always a lot of opportunities to do research with other professors, either in the CS department or uh, cross departments. Um, but yeah, basically like a lot of the time you're admitted with the understanding that you might switch advisors later on. So there's one student in Samir's group that had sort of started doing research with him at the end of her second year of her PhD and seems to be mainly focusing on research with him at this point. Um, so it's, it, it's typically very fluid, um, but these situations are things that you have to work out on a per advisor basis. So you, you have to discuss it with all parties involved. Uh, Gavin, there's a question for you in the chat specifically about uh, whether you always lived with your partner or whether you moved in together later and how that works. Um, yeah, so we, we moved into UCI when I first started as a graduate student. Um, I know that the housing office, um, they, they tend to want to work with you. So if you want to move in with your partner, you can... Um, yeah, you can try and just contact the housing office and then see if you can get moved into a family unit. Um, yeah, as, as a graduate student, you are, um, you're guaranteed housing, so they, they might do their best to try and accommodate you. Um, but I'm not sure if it's guaranteed if you, if you start with a roommate and then want to, to move out. Um, that's probably a good question to send an email just to the housing office and see if, if they have any more details. I think if you already have a roommate, you would basically fill out the same kind of applications you would do if you want like a different apartment or whatnot. So you basically put on like a wait list and then you have to specifically say that you want to go into like family housing or whatnot. And there are some, uh, some forms you have to fill out um, that, you know, you're actually a partner and not just it's not just a friend that's posing as your partner basically right i don't remember what the exact details you don't have to be married or anything but there you have to fill out some stuff but yeah so one more question that uh, i have uh, is about uh, internships okay so my my biggest mistake as a PhD, when I was a PhD student is that I didn't do any internship, and uh, I heard from uh, the dean that uh, 
you know, uh, it's it's relatively simple to do internships here because, you know, we have Google uh, um, in two, three miles from here, right? There are so many companies that there are all these uh, events that take place in the fall uh, about recruiting. So what, what are your, uh, what is your experience uh, with internships? I guess I've, I've been here long enough to have done a couple of them. Um, so yeah, I've, I've, I've stayed over the summer, I believe two years and I've interned for two years or I will be, yeah, I have interned for two years. So I've interned at Google and also at a startup company called Diffbot. Um, I highly recommend, I mean, I, I highly recommend both experiences. So I don't think you should intern every summer because summer can be like one of the best times to do research. Your advisor will be more free. You'll be more free. It's, it's, it's a very nice kind of calm time to be around campus. So it, it ends up being very productive if you do stay here. Um, and you do end up getting paid. To, well, you can get paid more money over summer because it's not expected that you're taking classes, which ends up um, affecting your fees and stuff like that. Um, so I think I think it is great to stay at UCI and do research, but it's also really good to get out into industry for uh, at least a couple of years. Um, one, it will help grow your network. So it's really good to have a big professional network. Um, and typically as a PhD student doing internships, you're gonna meet people that you want to do research with later on. So uh, for my Google internship, we ended up submitting a paper to the latest ACL conference. Um, and so I think that that was really beneficial. Um, and in addition to that, you make way more money. So it's always a good idea to do it because um, you'll feel very comfortable for the years after you do internships. Okay, so some people are asking about the uh, CS grad student Slack channel. Um, this is a Slack channel for all CS grad students. Um, it's currently not very active, um, and I'm trying to get an invite link for for you all, and I'll, I'll paste that in the chat once I once I get that. Um, but yes, it's for for all graduate students in CS. Uh, somebody also asked, do advisors help in getting internships? Yes, uh, absolutely. If you have, if your advisor has, I mean, your advisor likely has, you know, many PhD students in industry and can ask them like, hey, uh, is there, you know, an intern spot in your group somewhere or stuff like that, like for sure. That's, uh... You're definitely more likely to get the internships that you want to do um, through your advisor. Yeah. Um, maybe there are some other questions also in the document that we haven't covered yet. Uh, so we had the question whether, so about like vaccinations, for example, um, I would say if you're an international student, uh, student get all vaccinations done that you can, uh, you will need a certain list of vaccinations. And I assume the COVID vaccine will be added to that in the fall. So basically get everything from that list and the COVID vaccine if you can. Now, I expect that usually the US doesn't have uh, like vaccine like entry requirements. So you can probably come here and move here without doing vaccinations and then do them here. But uh, it will save you some some stress, uh, I think, to just get them done early and make sure you have them. Yeah. Um, yeah. They're, they're, they're pretty easy to schedule through the um, student health center also. Yeah, so you, you can do them here. Uh, there are some caveats to that, like uh, if they take too long, then you can get like an academic hold and stuff like that. And you have to contact people to get it removed and stuff like that. So I, I would say if you can, uh, so they are compulsory. Uh, so the question somebody asked, are they compulsory in the US? In the US, no, in, the, in UCI, yes. So you will need a list of vaccinations that you can find uh, somewhere on the like student health websites um yeah 
So there's like your basics, MMR and all those kinds of things. And I assume the COVID vaccine will be added to that in the fall, almost certainly, I guess. So yeah, get everything done you can. Um, the advantage is if you're doing it here, uh, all the vaccinations are free here. Um, so if your health insurance, wherever you are, requires you to pay for vaccinations, I guess you can save money by doing them here. But as I said, if you can do them at home, I would do them at home first. So also let, uh, let me add that, you know, Orange County that the uh, UCI is, uh, is doing great job, right, with uh, the vaccines. The COVID vaccine, yeah, yeah. Yeah, with the COVID vaccine, really? right. And uh, well. some of us have already done or we do very soon the first dose of uh, the COVID vaccine. Uh, so are vaccinations com compulsory in the US? No. They are not, but uh, you know, I mean. But they are at UCI, so realistically you will need. Yeah, them. so you need, yeah. <laughs> or they can, yeah. Okay. Um, okay, there's a bunch more questions in the document. Let's see. Um, average time to graduation, uh, graduation depends on your group and your advisor, I would say. I'm not sure what the number is for the CS department. It's public, I think. I don't remember what it is. Um, I think but, it's like five, between five and six. Yeah, it's like five and a half or something like that. But it depends a lot on your, your group. Um, yeah, so it's, it's difficult to say. You should ask maybe your advisor what, or you can actually check your advisor's previous PhD students usually and see how long they took to graduate. Or you can ask somebody from the group, like what's the normal time in there in the group? Um, how many years is funding guaranteed? I think six, if I remember correctly. I'm not sure, but I think so. Um, but yeah, I would say it's very like at least if you if you take up to six years, it's uh, very likely that everything is guaranteed. If you need like maybe an extra year or something, it can probably be arranged with your advisor and people have to sign off on things. But uh, yeah, but if you take much longer than that, then I guess it becomes more tricky. Um, then we have a question on how comprehensive is the UC ship health insurance? Does it cover mental health. It does to some degree. I haven't used it, so I don't know the details. I'm not sure if anybody here does. I, I would probably check out the, the official documentation for that. Yeah. We're, we're definitely not authorities on what yeah. the um, health insurance covers. It does cover dental, which is pretty nice. Um, yes. And, uh, and vision also to some degree, right? Um, how can we meet other professors and students who are not signed up for the visit day? I mean, like uh, right now, I'm not sure. I mean, if you have a specific professor that you want to talk to, I would send them an email and try to contact them. Um, once you're admitted, of course, and, and you come here, presumably uh, we'll be back to more or less normal business, so it should be much easier to meet people and and also professors. Uh, right now, you pretty much have to, you know, email people to get them into a Zoom call or something like that. Um, okay. Let's see. So we have a schedule question. This is, of course, uh, it comes with a huge caveat that it's COVID time. So it's pretty much working from home all day, I would say. <laughs> my, my schedule is wake up, work at home, then uh, go work out and eat, and then go to sleep <laughs> more or less. But it's different when you actually have places to go. Yeah, and I think sched schedules can vary very drastically yeah. among like if you have a conference students. or something with a deadline due then it's uh, a lot more work and then maybe afterwards it's a little bit more relaxing and yeah i think that's in general about uh, doing a phd it's not like a nine to five at least for most people you can try to make it one 
Um, I definitely know there are people that, that do. I don't really try to, to do that. So I work when I feel productive and I don't work when I don't feel productive. Um, but yeah, oh, different people. Are yeah, one, I mean, one thing, one thing uh, is we can say about the current situation, like, so we, there is no lockdown here, right? So everybody can, uh, can go out. Uh, of course, you cannot dine in, in restaurants. Yeah. yeah. Only if you sit outside. If they have uh, outside dining, uh, but you know when when these people, uh, you know, in six months from now, you cannot predict, right? Probably uh, we will go back to normal. I mean, you you never know. But right now, everybody can go out. You know, the, we don't have a lockdown, right? Yes. So, However, you uh, can't really meet with people if you're in the student housing right now. Still, right? They they've added this like zot bubble stuff, but. Yeah, basically, it's still pretty limited if you're in you know, student housing. But things should get better soon, I think. Now that especially the, the grad students are all getting vaccinated now, basically, because we're all either TAs or RAs. And so we're university employees and we can get vaccinated now. So I think a lot of people uh, in two or three months, I think people things will already look quite a lot different. Um, also, um, regarding schedule, like in contrast to undergrad, where you have a lot of classes and like back to back classes sometimes, I know that was the case for me. Um, yeah, you don't spend a ton of time in class. Like I take two classes a quarter and maybe have one or two meetings a week. So that gives you a lot of flexibility to sort of design your schedule as you want. Yeah. Yeah. It can also change, like uh, if you have TA, then like what class you're taking for some, some of them are like more demanding than others. So yeah, it's, it's uh, not fixed throughout the year. Yeah, I mean, just to provide like quantify, I know people that come into the lab at like 5 a.m. and leave at 2 p.m. And I know people that come into the lab at like 5 p.m. and leave at 2 a.m. So yeah, it, it really can vary. Yeah. It also depends on your advisor a little bit. Like I think some advisors themselves want to maintain more of a nine to five job. So that's where they are available and whatnot. Whereas uh, other advisors might not work on that in that way. Um, oh, one more question is about uh, attending conferences. Uh, how, how often? Okay, I, I, that's pre-COVID, I guess. Uh, so I, I just want to say that you know also depends on your advisor, right? If if he if he has funding to fund your uh, um, to fund you attending a conference or not, right? But what is your experience uh, on this? Maybe Rob uh, because he's uh, fourth year. Yeah. So so in my experience, if you have a paper published at a conference um, and you are one of the main authors on that paper it'd be very uncommon for you not to attend and present that paper at the conference. And if you do, at least every time I've done it, I've been able to be fully reimbursed for all of the expenses, including like um, your accommodations and the food you eat. Um, so yeah, I th the, 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 you can talk to the admins about it. Um, there are limitations on what you, you like, for instance, can't spend money on alcohol um, but you can, um, like the, the amount that you can spend on food per day is pretty reasonable. Um, so it, it, it's, it's always fun to go to conferences and usually they will be fully funded. So it's a good opportunity to travel. Um, I, yeah, I, I've had great experiences with it and I've always been fully reimbursed. Um, so another question is, so I'm going through the document again. Okay, so we have, is it easy slash possible to get to the ocean mountains slash LA from Irvine? And is there public transport? So I, we, we covered this a little bit earlier. So I would say, um, so again, assuming without a car, with a, with a car, it's easy. And then you just drive there, basically. Uh, assuming you don't go, uh, you know, don't go to LA during rush hour and stuff like that, basically. But uh, so if you don't have a car, I would say getting to the beach is pretty easy with a bike. Uh, the closest one, I think, is Corona del Mar. Uh, that one is only like maybe six miles or so from the from UCI. So that's very possible. 
um, the further the ones that are further away are Crystal Cove, which is still quite possible, Newport Beach, and then Huntington it starts getting a little bit further. Um, to the mountains is a pain in the ass with a bike because you're going to the mountains. I mean, what do you expect? You know, you're uh, going uphill a lot, so I'm not sure I would recommend that. To LA, um, I think the best way to get to LA is to take the train from uh, the Metrolink or the Amtrak. Uh, so for example, you can take, I think the closest train station, unfortunately there's the, the train station is not super close to here. So if you want to get to LA, at least the way I've done it in the past is to uh, go to either Tustin or Irvine train station and take the train from there, which takes, I don't know, 40 minutes, an hour or something like that. I don't remember exactly. Um, it's not super expensive. It's, I think it's $10 or something, maybe even less. There's like a student rate also, I think. Uh, but yeah, the, the main struggle is that you have to get to the train station first. So you have to either bike there and lock up your bike, or as I do it, I, I skate there and I can take my skates with me, which is quite nice. Um, and also, I should mention with the trains, they have a really annoying schedule. Like I think on the weekends, especially the last train back, is like super early. It's like 5 p.m. or something. So that's really the one of the biggest issues with the public transport. Um, so yeah, I think the if they wanted to really improve the public transport here, one thing they should do is should have more trains to LA, and they should have more uh, bus service to the train station. Um, but yeah. So it's possible. Um, beaches are easy, mountains are hard, LA is somewhere in the middle. <laughs> um, I see a question about parking. I can just quickly say um, one thing that's nice to know that people won't tell you is that you are faculty. Um, so you can apply for faculty parking permits and those will let you park like anywhere across campus instead of in the designated parking zones. Um, so if you if you're going to commute, definitely do that. Don't buy a student permit. Um, there's I think there's like seven parking garages across campus. You'll probably end up parking in the anteater parking structure most of the time. Um, it can get pretty crowded like around noon every day because there's a lot of undergraduates that are coming for courses that like kind of overlap those hours. Um, so I would try to get there earlier than that. Um, but generally, if they haven't like accidentally given out way too many permits, which sometimes happens in some quarters, it's it's usually pretty reasonable to find a parking spot. It's like a seven story parking structure or something. So plenty of parking. Also, if you live on campus, you will have, uh, so depending on the community, but if you live in Palo Verde or uh, Verano place, you will have parking here as well, so. You may even get lucky and get a garage, but uh, that's not, depends on the unit that you get. So one question is, uh, and maybe the last one, because we have four more minutes. Mm -hmm. So can you do research in another university while studying at UCI? Uh, what is your experience? I mean. I guess you can collaborate with uh, anybody, right? But uh, what is your experience on this? I, I think it's heavily advisor dependent. Um, so, I mean, if, if your advisor okays it, then you, you're okay to do it. Um, but otherwise, like it might not be considered your time as an RA. So usually if you're collaborating with other people, you're collaborating and your advisor is a co-author. And if that's the case on papers, um, it's a much easier situation. Um, otherwise, like it's hard to get reimbursed for travel to conferences if like no one else on it from UCI is on the paper. Um, it also, I should also say it depends on like who's funding the work though too. Cause I think if you have fellowships then, or like grants for certain types of research, then that could fall under those grants and it might be easier to pay for things. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. So it's definitely advisor dependent the answer. So you need to talk to your advisor about this. So a last question that uh, I have is the following. Um, 
basically if, if in in two three words if you can say what is like the the main reason that uh, you joined uci for example what is the main strength of uh, uci and maybe you know uh, this is uh, an incentive right for the admitted students to to join us i mean you can say just the one phrase it's of the panel uh, students um okay i guess I'll, I'll start again so for me the main reasons were my advisor um the location and overall quality of life here i would say those were my main three reasons and i would advise other students that those are quite important your advisor and the general quality of life in your phd are quite important um ditto <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with that sentiment and, and probably in that order too. Um, like probably foremost is your advisor because um, I mean, that's what you're going to be doing every day is, is interacting with them and, and doing research. Um, and then second, yeah, is all the stuff you do outside of research. So uh, access to things like nature and the city and, and things like that. Uh, and of course, no snow and always sunny, <laughs> so. Yes. Yeah, um, I pretty, uh, pretty much echo those things as well. And then also when I was deciding, I talked to a lot of students at each of the places I was considering. And I think that's super important because that gives you a good idea of what it might be like for you as well. And pretty uniformly, everyone seemed really happy here. So that definitely influenced my decision. Same here. <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have anything more to add to what the other students say, but yeah. Okay, awesome. So thanks everybody. Uh, so the session is over. We are, we were supposed to end at uh, 12. So if there are any other questions, basically feel free to, to send emails uh, to your, uh, um, to, to those that made you an offer to your advisors and uh, they will uh, be able to answer it. Okay, so um Fezal, do you want to, to take it from here or Jean? Uh, yes, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Janice. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank you so you much, much. To uh, the panelists. Um, I think that was uh, like really informative to everyone. Uh, I may add that, of course, kind of like also feel free to interact with the uh, student volunteers in the Slack channel. There is almost, I think, 25 or 30 students uh, who are currently at UCI who or watching this live channel and would be happy to answer any questions that you have. So we're going to now start the lunch break and hopefully in 45 minutes, we're going to continue with the, with the uh, social hour. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I'll, I'll see you then. And if you have any questions in the meantime, feel free to share them. I'll see you everyone later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.